virtual Bible study. And we welcome you to the virtual Bible study for Thursday, March 28th, 2019. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Jacob Gwynn. My father, Greg Gwynn, is here. Hello, Dad. Jacob, great to be here. It's kind of hectic trying to get hey, here. You've been but, out of town this week. You yeah. got an excuse. We're but, running uh, late, but we're, we're glad to get started and, and talk about an important Bible subject. Kyle's right on time tonight. Kyle, welcome to the program. It's good to be here. Glad that you're here. Look forward to hearing from you. And we want to hear from you on the other end of the line tonight at 877-381-4567. Questions at collegeview.com. And uh, send your comments in the chat room tonight. Uh, with uh, Share your thoughts with other listeners. As you file into the chat room, be sure to sign in uh, so you'll be ready to send in those comments. Proofs for Bible inspiration tonight. But uh, before we begin, if you'd like to help us get the word out about the virtual Bible study, send us an email to questions at college. We'll send you a, uh, a bumper sticker. Uh, if you have a question about something that you've heard or just a suggestion for a future topic on the virtual Bible study, one of those last week uh, uh, that was su submitted in the chat room was, how, what, how does a, a faithful Christian man or faithful Christian woman, how does that look in today's wicked world? Good yeah. suggestion. Had another listener who, su uh, who seconded that idea, thought that would be a good suggestion, so that's one we've got to put in the pile. Okay. But um, if you have a suggestion for a future topic or just a question that you'd like answered in this format, questions at collegeview.com, we can keep you... Your name uh, and identity confidential, obviously. If you'd like that, just uh, submit your question or your uh, suggestion for a topic. And and we keep mentioning, and we're going to keep mentioning, that there's another resource available these days at collegeview.com, and that is that we are live streaming our Bible studies and worship services. Mm -hmm. So at the times of our services, and, and those times are listed there on our homepage, uh, you can watch live, but if you're not able to watch live, you can go back and watch those uh, services in archives on YouTube. They're all automatically archived on YouTube. In fact, Jacob, this week I, I watched your sermon from Sunday. You preached while I was away, and Josh McCord preached Sunday evening while I was away, and both of you had really good lessons. I was able to uh, Just to like you were here, act huh? like I was there in person. All right. That, Kyle, thank you again for getting that out there. It's looking great. Um, and so on to our topic of discussion tonight, best arguments. You ask our listeners for their best arguments. You know, we've been doing, we, we've got kind of got a little bit of a theme a running theme here. Now, we haven't done it in every consecutive week, but we've asked our listeners to provide their best arguments proofs, or what we're asking for is what makes most sense to you? What's the most compelling argument in your mind? And we talked about evolution versus creation. What are your arguments? We talked about the existence of God, and we talked about the, the proofs of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But we were asking our listeners to say, what do you think? What, what works best in your mind? And so we're going to continue that theme tonight. And to our update list earlier today, we sent out these questions. Number one, define and explain what Bible inspiration really is as contrasted with some false views that people might have when they talk about inspiration. Okay. Number two, what are the most powerful proofs in your mind concerning Bible inspiration? And number three, how would you answer the critic who says, oh, sure, the Bible might have been inspired centuries ago, but what we have today is so corrupted that we don't even have an idea of what the original text really was, because there are plenty of skeptics who say that. So how would you answer them if, if you confront, are confronted by someone who makes that argument? All right. Uh, let's get started on the discussion tonight. Uh, and, and you started off in a good spot. We've got to define terms here before we can really prove the Bible's inspired. We've got to talk about what do we mean about uh, what do we mean when we say inspiration, the Bible's inspired. Yeah, uh, because that word uh, is used loosely in many contexts yeah. uh, uh, in, in just conversation. For instance... I saw a beautiful sunset, and I was inspired to sit down and do a painting. Yeah. Uh, I, I was so in love with my girlfriend that it just inspired me to write a poem about Somebody her. Somebody starts an exercise program, loses lots of weight, and you say, boy, you inspire me you to inspire start me exercising. To, yeah, 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 yeah. So the word gets used pretty loosely, and it's used loosely in regards to the Bible as well. And one of the, I guess one of the, the big issues that I think we have to address is that people have the idea that the, God gave the Bible writers sort of an idea. 
to give him a broad general concept and then he let them fill that in in their own words for instance brotherly love that's a bible theme and and so god sort of put in their mind that they should address this idea of brotherly really laid love it on john's mind and it, it was particularly particularly a thing that john was uh, yeah. uh, up on he really laid it on it yeah. yeah uh but but the actual words they just came up with those words on their own and they, they and they fleshed out that general idea uh in their own way and that is just absolutely not what Bible inspiration is. Um, in fact, you know, if that was the case, we wouldn't have a very useful book in the Bible because how would we know the parts that God actually wanted them to say versus what they just in their fallible minds came up with? Yeah. You know, so what, you know, it's sort of the idea parts of the Bible are inspired, but parts of it are just what men wrote. Well, what parts? How do we tell? Yeah, uh, and, and so that would leave us in a in a, a real predicament uh, when it comes to the Bible. Yeah, uh, and Kent and uh, and Georgia said that thought inspiration. This view falsely affirms that God inspired only the thoughts of the writers, but left them to their own discretion to choose the words to write. This view denies the inf infallibility of the divine message of the Bible. Exactly right. So, you, and and you know what that does though, if I believe that 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 God just inspired the words then that opens up the Bible for me just to pick and choose what I want to... Oh, you mean if he, if he just gave the general thoughts? No, not the word, just yeah. the general thoughts. Yeah. That opens... Then I see something in the Bible that I don't... You know, that just doesn't make sense to me. For well, instance, a, Paul, you know, uh, modern-day women's movements have argued that Paul was a male chauvinist. And when you read in the Bible the things that he says about let women keep silence in the church, not permitted them to speak, 1 Corinthians 14, well, that was just Paul coming through. Yeah, it doesn't, uh, that doesn't make sense to me. That's not from God. That was just Paul. No, God wouldn't want that. Yeah. So I'll just discredit that and say, well, that was his idea. That's wrong. Yeah. And so now we can have our women preachers. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we got to, it's very important to define inspiration for what it really is. And, and Kent goes on there with, with some good, also fallible ideas in his email. Yes, yeah, some that I hadn't heard before. Um, he says, naturalistic in inspiration. This view falsely affirms that the writers of the Bibles were only inspired in their sense of the, their natural abilities as writers. So. And, and that would be sort of like what I was saying earlier. You know, an artist is moved by a beautiful sunset. An inventor has a bright idea, and he produces an ingenious device. Uh, an author writes a moving piece of literature, but they were inspired. Just ba th their abilities were inspired, and they acted. Yeah. And that's not, that's not Bible inspiration. Here's one. I, don't, I haven't heard of this. Neo-Orthodox inspiration. This view falsely states the Bible is inspired only if the reader comprehends such as being true. This view is built upon the false philosophy philosophy of subjectivism. So okay. I guess if it if it's true to, if it's true for you, then it's inspired. If it, if it's yeah. not true for somebody uh, else, then it's not. And boy, a lot of people are going that way these days. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's what it means to you. Yeah, that's not what it means to me. You 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 read it that way. I'll read it this way. Mm -hmm. All right. Encounter inspiration. The false view. Uh, this false view argues that the Bible is only a vehicle of inspiration, but not within itself inspired. That such becomes inspired only when the reader has a personal encounter with God, separate and apart from the Scriptures, and even then has errors recorded in its pages. So you got to have something beyond the Bible, I guess. You yeah. have some kind of encounter yeah. with God. Uh, here's one. Mechanical dictation inspiration. This view advocates the truth of the divine origin of the Bible and views such as the only standard of authority. However, this view advocates error in viewing biblical inspiration as nothing more than God using human instrumentality as nothing more than mechanical stenographers. Even a casual study of the Scripture proves uh, in writing, uh, differences in writing styles. Biblical inspiration is God choosing the words from the vocabulary and writing style of the various authors to express his words. So I think what Kinsey is saying there is exactly right also. Uh, in other words, the, the, the Bible writers were not just stenographers. God wasn't just dictating and they were d writing down word for word what he said. Because if that was the case, all of the Bible would be written in exactly the same style. And it's not. For instance, it's very easy when you're, we're studying in the New Testament to, to detect a difference in style between the Apostle Paul and the Apostle John. So, 
what God did is he used those men and he used those talents. Let, let, let me read to you. A, a, this is from a, a booklet called Inspiration of the Bible by Homer Haley. Many of our listeners know the name Homer Haley. He says, verbal inspiration of the scriptures is what I believe. I mean by this that when prophets of the old covenant or apostles of the new spoke or wrote, they spoke and wrote by inspiration, God giving them the idea and selecting and choosing from their vocabulary the words that they were to use in making the idea known. I simply affirm that the original message and the original manuscripts were spoken and written by men as they were guided by the Holy Spirit, both in thought and in the words uh, in which those thoughts were made known. I believe the Bible sustains this proposition. Okay. So uh, the, uh, uh, here, here's another quote from uh, a, a booklet called The Meaning of Inspiration by Frank Gabeline. He says, the original documents of the Bible were written by men who, though permitted the exercise of their own personalities and literally, literary talents, yet wrote under the control and guidance of the Spirit of God, the result being in every word of the original documents a perfect and errorless recording of the exact message which God desired to give to man. Okay. So uh, uh, that's what the Bible, actually that's what the Bible claims. Uh, for instance, look at Second Samuel. I got a couple examples from the Old Testament, and then some from the New Testament. Second Samuel chapter twenty-three and verse two. So the Bible claims that everything in it is from God, word e for word. Word for word. All right, show me. Second Samuel twenty-three verse two. The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and His word was in my tongue. Okay. Notice he doesn't say his thoughts were in my mind when I was speaking. He says his words were in my tongue. How about this? In uh, Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18, Moses is telling the Israelites about Jesus. He was prophesying about Jesus. I will raise them up a prophet from among them, um, from among their brethren, like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I'll require it of him. Notice, not thoughts, but words. He, I'm going to give him words. Mm -hmm. And then one more. Here's Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 9. The Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. So that's what the Bible claims. That, th those are some Old Testament uh, examples. And we could show also in the New Testament, we're going to have to hurry to cover all this. But in the New Testament, we know that that's the, the way the Scriptures were viewed. Uh, in Matthew, just as an example, in Matthew chapter 22, Jesus was confronted by the Sadducees. And we remember that the Sadducees were sad. That's how we remember. They were sad. They didn't believe in life beyond the grave. Right. And so they confronted him about the situation uh, where a man had been married and he died and his brother took the wife and he died and uh, another brother took the wife. Seven brothers had the same wife uh, and they thought they had Jesus trapped. They had a perfect scenario yeah. there. He couldn't uh, answer. Yeah. Uh, but Jesus says in, in, in responding to them, he says in Matthew 22, verse 31, as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Now that quote comes from Exodus 3, when God spoke to Moses at the burning bush. Who am I going to tell him sent me? He says, tell him, I am sent you, and tell him, I am the, I, notice, I am, present tense, I am the, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Well, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had been dead for centuries, and yet he said, I am their God. Well, that means they're still living, right? And so Jesus, it's interesting that Jesus composed his whole argument in response to the Sadducees on the tenths of a verb. One verb, a, the tenths of one verb. Yeah, and so Jesus obviously believed that the scriptures were verbally inspired, word for word. God, God made sure that the men, he, let, he used them, he used their personalities, he used their, their uh, vocabulary, he used their dialect, he used their style, but... They never put on the page a single thing that he didn't want on the page. Paul does similar, and he refers back to Abraham again in Galatians chapter 3, verse 16, when he refers to the plural or singular form of a noun. 
He says, and now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not to, and to seeds, plural, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So Paul makes a reference to the singular, plural uh, case of a, of a noun. So obviously God, uh, Christ believed that every word was inspired. Paul did as well. Exactly right. So we got to have that, I think, correct view of inspiration, what it means. All right. And there's, there's another argument you can make because... In the Old Testament, the people that were writing didn't understand what they were writing about. So if God is just inspiring thoughts or ideas, yeah. saying, hey, why don't you write an essay about Jesus and him coming? Well, they didn't understand what they were writing they about. They didn't know. But First they... Peter chapter 1, verse 10, of which salvations the, the, the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when he testified it beforehand. Uh, the sufferings of Christ. So yeah. They didn't understand what they were writing about. So it couldn't be that they were using their own invention to to pin those words. They had, they they were simply doing what God inspired them to do. All right. Real Randy quickly. In yeah, Swiss Creek, Creek, Michigan. Inspiration may be defined uh, as divine influence directly exerted on the mind of man. The term plenary means full, complete, entire. The term verbal pertains to words rather than ideas. Thus, when one speaks of the inspiration of the Bible, one should speak of inspiration. Of, of inspiration. God gave them to men the actual words he wished to be recorded through the Holy Spirit. The words the Holy Spirit gave to the men who penned God's holy word conveys the thoughts God wanted to convey to men rather than ideas. I believe in biblical inspiration, which is plenary or complete, and verbal, which is down to the word. Word to word. Exactly right, right Randy. Exactly, exactly right. right. All right, we need to get a break. When we get back, we'll get your thoughts. Uh, and we need to get to the next uh, question where you ask for powerful proofs yeah. that our listeners could submit. Yeah. And if you want to submit them in the chat room today, tonight, why don't you just take a minute during the break and send us one of the proofs that you think shows so that you, the Bible So inspired. we got several people listening Tell us just one argument. You only have to give one. Why do you put so much confidence in the Bible? Why do you believe that it is a flawless revelation of God's will? What what argument appeals to you most? I see Lou in Minneapolis, and I see Jeff in Tennessee. Jeff and Lou may have heard different arguments. Yeah. Hey, that's a lot of geography. Rick is in there. Rick? Where's Rick? I'm not sure. Uh, well, there, we're from, Rick, tell us where you're at. We're, we're for all over. And so yeah. there may be, maybe yeah. you've heard something yeah. that our listeners haven't heard, uh, so a proof that you like. Why don't you send it in the chat room? Don't go anywhere. The Virtual Bible Study continues right after this. Don't touch that mouse. The Virtual Bible Study will be back right after this. Warning, this is to make you aware of a disorder plaguing American and the metro area, BDD, Bible Deficit Disorder. Many people are not getting enough Bible in their daily lives. Are you? Answer the following questions to see if you might be suffering from BDD. Do you answer spiritual questions by saying, I think, instead of, the Bible says? Do you depend on religious authors and pastors to tell you what to believe? When Benny Hinn says, this is your day for a miracle, do you believe him? If you answered yes to any of these questions, then you might be suffering from BDD, Bible Deficit Disorder. The College View Church of Christ is dedicated to fighting BDD by teaching the Bible. We focus on Christ by following his word. Don't succumb to BDD. Bible Deficit Disorder. Fight it by joining us for Bible study on Sunday at 9.30 a.m. and Wednesday at 7 p.m. As long as there is breath in your body, it is not too late to fight Bible Deficit Disorder. We'll see you this Sunday at the College of View Church of Christ. Hello, my name is Preston Jackson. I'm from Valdosta, Georgia, and I want to hear your comments. So if you have one, call 931-381-4567 or email your questions at questions at collegeview.com. Use your internet connection for something good. Listen to the virtual Bible study every week. Now, back to the program. Back on the program tonight, we're talking about inspiration of the Bible and proofs, uh, best arguments that uh, you believe show that the Bible is inspired. One more verse as we talk about the Bible has to be inspired word for word. That's what the writers even claimed. Notice what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, beginning. But God hath revealed to them and to us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things which are freely given to us of God. 
which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Paul said they were speaking the actual words that God had given them to speak. So is the Bible inspired down to the word? Absolutely. Paul said it was. Yeah, exactly right. All right, All right so what's, what's your, to you, what is the most compelling argument that proves that the Bible is inspired, as we were just defining true Bible inspiration? Uh, uh, I want to, both Kent and Randy by, by email have given a, a pretty quick and concise answer, which we always ask for, by the way, on the virtual Bible study. Uh, so let's read their answers, and then we'll flesh them out, Jacob. Okay, let's start with Randy in Swartz Creek, Michigan. Everything in the Bible that can be proven right or wrong, touching history, geography, science, has always proven right. Also, God fulfilled every prophecy, uh, or also Jesus fulfilled every prophecy about him. The Bible is the inspired word of God. So he has a couple answers there. The first one being that the Bible is accurate historically, geographically, and, with and when it touches science. And then fulfilled prophecies. Yep. Okay, so two, th- okay, all right, we got his two ideas. All right, and now to Kent. He says the Bible uh, has, is scientifically accurate, historically accurate, fulfilled prophecy, and logical accuracy. There is complete harmony of the writers with no contradictions. So he mentioned some of the same things there. Accuracy about s- things like science and history. He mentions fulfilled prophecy. But he mentions one that I think is, is also very strong, maybe the strongest in my mind, and that the, there's a complete harmony of the writers, and there's no contradiction. That is an amazing thing when you stop to think about it, because the Bible was written over a period of 1,500 years. The oldest parts of the Bible in the Old Testament written by Moses about 1,500 years before Christ. The, the newest things in the Bible are the New Testament documents, which were written in the first century A.D. So over that about 1,500-year period, about 40 different men were used by God to record his written message for mankind. Well, think about that. First of all, they weren't, most of them didn't know each other. Some of them did, obviously, but, but most of them did not know each other. They certainly didn't have an opportunity to sit down around some big conference table somewhere and say, okay, now, when, whenever we write about Let's use brotherly love. We talk about whenever we write about brotherly love, be sure to say this and don't say that because we don't want to contradict each other. Let's make sure we're all on the same page here. And we're talking about the coming of the Messiah. That's going to be thousands of years down the road. Let's make sure that we get all of our facts straight. Yeah, make, uh, whatever it. you're predicting about him, make sure you don't contradict what I predict about yeah, him. Yeah, right. Uh, they didn't have, what we're saying is they did not have a chance to do that. Uh, Moses wrote, as we said, about 15, 14, 1,500 years before Christ. King David wrote about 1,000 years, wrote the Psalms about 1,000 years before Christ. Daniel was a famous prophet of the Old Testament. He wrote in the 6th century B.C. And, of course, the book of Acts and many of the New Testament documents uh, are dated in the 60s A.D. So uh, over a long period of time, and even from very diverse geographical locations, Moses wrote from the Sinai wilderness, Daniel from Babylon, Jeremiah from Jerusalem, Paul wrote from a prison in Rome. So they were scattered all over the globe, and they didn't even speak the same languages. The Old Testament was written primarily in Hebrew. There's a little bit of Aramaic in the Old Testament. The New Testament was written in Koine Greek. Uh, they, 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 weren't, they weren't even writing in the same languages and they came from a very diverse background. Just the, the separation and time periods that they lived in would be yeah. certainly yeah. A, yeah. a big challenge to overcome yeah. if you wanted harmony. Oh, that's interesting because just this week while I was in Houston, we had a chance to visit a theological library there that had a, uh, it had a very interesting display of the Dead Sea Scrolls. But there was a 1611 King James, original edition 1611 King James Bible. The words are all changed. I, I couldn't even read it hardly. Yeah. And, and so that's just 400 years ago. Think about these writers writing over a period of 1,500 years. Words change meaning. How are we going to keep it all together? Yeah. What but God think, did. You think about, go back a couple hundred years ago, 250, back when our nation was founded. 
and maybe some Americans are right about about medical things. You know, they still thought if you got sick, Kyle, well, you need to put some leeches on you and get that bad blood out of you, right? I mean, think about the things that have changed. If you took some just some writings on on just a, a some subject and laid it next to what people would write about today, there would be no harmony at all. And yet you've got this period of about 1,500 years, and it's perfectly harmonized. Not only is it harmonized, it's got a common theme that runs throughout that yeah. is completely harmonious. Think of this diversity. Moses was educated in the wisdom of Egypt and probably had the best education available to anybody in Egypt in his day. David, of course, a powerful and successful king. But Amos, on the other hand, was just a common herdsman. Uh, Daniel was a statesman in Babylon, but Ezekiel was a priest. Luke in the New Testament was a physician. Matthew was a tax collector. I mean, they're just all over the board. They have all kinds of different social and economic and educational backgrounds. And, and so they put together a finished document over that long period of time by that many different men, and yet it all fits and there's no contradiction that unity that harmony of the scriptures there's really no way to explain no, that absolutely if not. it was not for the if, if you take away god if you take god out of the equation there's no way to explain that perfect harmony of the bible god was guiding the process and that to me that's a very powerful proof of inspiration all right uh eight seven seven three eight one four five six seven if you'd like to comment on the phone tonight now they both of our correspondents talked about accuracy of the bible and uh, historically, scientifically, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, so um, let's, let's talk about that for a minute. Uh, you know, as you were saying a minute ago, Jacob, back, back in, in Bible times, there were things that, to, that people didn't know that we just sort of take for granted. For instance, uh, the suspension of the earth. How is the earth held in place? Well, there have been some crazy ideas. Ancient men believed that the earth was held in position, carried on the back of a strong man, uh, maybe on the back of elephants. Who was standing on a turtle, wasn't that? What, yeah. One of them was standing on a turtle. Was yeah. it the strong man or the elephant? I'm not sure. Yeah. But uh, that's just an illustration but of the that's crazy. not too long ago. Now, also, you remember Columbus sailed the ocean blue in... 1492. 1492. What, what's that, about 600 years ago? Yeah. They and he, still thought the earth was flat. There were people who said, you won't come back. You're going over the edge, man. Yeah, yeah you won't come back. 600 years ago. Yeah. Now, why isn't the Bible, why doesn't we read about that in the Bible? So what does the Bible say about the suspension of the earth? Job 26, verse 7, God hangeth the earth upon nothing. What does it say about the shape of the earth? 2,500 years before men discovered that the earth was round, Isaiah said, it is he who sitteth upon the circle of the earth. And the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers. And by the word, by the way, the word therefore, circle of the earth, uh, means sphere. The Hebrew word means sphere. I'm not talking about a flat circle. Sir, he's not talking about a two-dimensional circle of the earth. He's talking about a three-dimensional sphere. When that Hebrew word was used, how did the, how did they write that when they didn't know that? They did not know that that was the case. And yet they wrote that, and here we are, and we've been able all these centuries later to either prove or deny their accuracy, and their accuracy has been proven. It's not a science book, but it, tu it touches on these things just sort of, you know, in passing. Even those passing references are 100% accurate. Exactly right. All right. I, I think that's a good point. I mean, the, as you said, the, the Bible is not a science book, but when it touches on science, it's accurate. We better grab a break, Jake. We'll get a break, and we're getting bullet point. You know we're going back in the archives for bullet points tonight. I didn't get a new one recorded today, so we're going back in time. We're going back to 2009, <coughs> January 1st, New Year's Day, 2009, for this week's bullet point. Uh, but while you're listening to it, send us your thoughts. Don't go anywhere. The Virtual Bible Study continues right after this. These guys are doing all of the talking. We need to hear from you. Call in now. The Virtual Bible Study continues right after this. This is Greg Gwynn with this week's bullet point. In rebuking the scribes and Pharisees, Jesus said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Ye blind guides, which strain at a gnat, and swallow a camel. Matthew 23, verses 23 and 24. 
Some have mistakenly taught that Jesus' problem with these religious hypocrites was their painstaking insistence upon keeping the minute aspects of their law. Jesus, it is claimed, was instructing them, and that for that matter us as well, not to worry about trying to keep the finer points of the law, but rather concentrate on the more substantial and meaningful matters of the heart. The problem, of course, with this interpretation is that it completely ignores what Jesus said. Should they have concerned themselves with something as simple as tithing their garden herbs? Yes. Jesus said, these ought ye to have done. But in doing this, he urged them not to neglect things that require even more effort to perfect. Things like judgment, mercy, and faith. The weightier matters of the law. We think there is a fitting application of the principle that Jesus here sets forth. Consider this. From time to time, we hear of a brother or sister who is quite upset about some issue. It is often one of those finer points of the law. For instance, the length of a woman's hair, or how many children an elder must have, or whether or not to offer the Lord's Supper on Sunday evening. They will gladly debate at length in favor of their particular understanding of the matter. We have no problem with this. All such things are important. But then this same person will neglect the assemblies fail to participate in the work of the church, exhibit moral impurity, etc. It seems that such folks need to attend to the weightier matters of the law. They should stop straining at a gnat while swallowing a camel. Do you see it? That's this week's bullet point. Think about it. I am Nestor Sanchez from Arica, Chile in South America, and I love to listen to the virtual Bible study. And this moment, I invite you to participate in this program too. Gracias. Quit checking your email. The commercials are over and the virtual Bible study is ready to roll. Take it away, guys. We're back on the program tonight. Remind you, this program is brought to you by the College of Church of Christ in Columbia, Tennessee. You can find out more about us at our website, thevirtualbiblestudy.com. And if you're anywhere near the Columbia, Tennessee area, we would encourage you to come and worship with us in person. And if you're not, you can still view our worship at our website. Check it out there. And uh, if you maybe, you maybe you attend someplace else, but you can still... Catch those sermons in the archives there on our yeah. website, or catch them in. The I gotta podcast. say, hey Kyle, I gotta really commend you for the for the way they're coming across. They, the the resolution is excellent. High five. Uh, and 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 it's really it's a it's a really good uh, product that that uh, Kyle and the other guys, uh, Jacob, you've been involved in that, and some others as well. It's really it's really a, a well done product and. Uh, I think you'll like it if you try it. All right. Well, congratulations, Kyle. Great job. Yep. Anyway, Just, did you yeah. not think he had it in him? Oh, no. You I, were I, surprised, I, right? I, no, I'm not <laughs> surprised. Okay, okay, right. I wasn't either. All right. Well, we're talking about inspiration tonight and uh, best arguments for uh, inspiration. And uh, the accuracy of the Bible is just uh, really uh, an amazing evidence and proof that the Bible is inspired. Yeah, they talked about, uh, our, our emailers talked about uh, accurate in regards to history. Well, history and archaeology, biblical archaeology are going to be linked there. Uh, and, and every time that men have dug things up, so to speak, Arch we talk about archaeology, they're just dig digging up stuff. Yeah, playing in the dirt. Every time they find something, it confirms what the Bible says rather yeah. than contradict it. Uh, for instance, here, here's an example. <clears throat> Not that long ago, a uh, hundred years ago, people were saying the, the Bible is wrong when it says that Moses wrote the first five books of the Old Testament because when Moses lived, people didn't even know how to write. Oh, we've got them. Yeah, so that just proves that the Bible is wrong yeah. because it's, it, it's claimed that Moses was the author of those early first five books called the Pentateuch, and he couldn't have been because nobody knew how to write when Moses was alive. Yeah, it's all a big hoax. Here's, here's a quote. In, in 1892, a critic wrote this, The time of which the pre-Mosaic narratives treat is a sufficient proof of their legendary character. It was a time prior to all knowledge of writing. Uh, so, in fact, some people said people didn't even know how to write really until about the time of Solomon. But in recent times, there have been archaeological discoveries that prove that writing was commonly practiced in the time of Moses. And now uh, an expert says, quote, that the question should ever have been raised, whether Moses could have known how to write, appears to us now absurd. In other words, you know, those guys who were saying that, they were way off base, and it's crazy that they were even making that accusation. Yeah, that's right. 
Uh, so again, we see that the Bible is accurate historically and, ge and archaeologically, uh, geographically. And we could cite a lot of examples, but just let me give you some summaries. Here's, here's a, a, a well-known Jewish archaeologist named Nelson Gluck wrote in a book called Rivers in the Desert, quote, it may be stated categorically that no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference. Scores of archaeological findings have been made which confirm in clear outline or exact detail historic statements in the Bible. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and, and, and the quotes can be multiplied, uh, but archaeologists are saying archaeology confirms the Bible is true. And again, the Bible is not a general history book. It's actually sort of a specific history book. It's, it's the specific history of the descendants of Abraham. But it's going to, obviously it's going to talk about people and nations and events and every time archaeologists discover something, they go back to the Bible and say, you know, the Bible was telling us this all along. The Bible is right. And what about, uh, you, you got some notes there about the Egyptian cities uh, that the Israelites helped to build? Yeah, Python. Python and Ramesses are described in the Bible as been, having been built by Israelite slaves. Exodus 1, 11, Exodus 5, beginning verse 10. The biblical account tells of Pharaoh increase, Pharaoh's increasing hardness against the slaves, first providing straw for making the bricks, then forcing them to gather stubble on their own for the bricks, and finally requiring them to make bricks with no straw. All three types of bricks have been found in those Egyptian uh, ruins. Goes along with what the Bible says. Yes. Yeah, yeah. All right. So that's just an example. There's a lot more. Boy, that's, a, that's a, obviously a very deep field, a, a field that men devote their whole lives to. But we're just saying history and archaeology confirm the Bible. But, but think about that, Jacob. If it's from God, we would expect no less than that. Yeah. If, God is, if God is behind the writing of the Bible, it's got to be accurate. Yes. Well, it is. There you go. And what about geography? I mean, this is, we can do this in pretty quickly as well, but geographically, the Bible is completely accurate as well. The Bible is not a geography book, but it does talk about geographical places you know, and, their re and, and their relationship to each other. With GPS today and satellite imagery, we maybe take that for granted, but that wasn't as easy a task back then as it is now. You even look at some maps when, uh, when our country was first founded. The maps that they drew of the United States weren't accurate. Very crude. Florida was maybe this big old glob down here and, and now, but we can see through the, uh, our view now, we can see that those are wrong. But in the scriptures, they were accurate. Every, they were again, they don't, the Bible doesn't, is not intended to be a geography book, but it, it's obviously going to talk about places. And it's going to talk about places in their relationship to other places. Always accurate. Now, uh, Kent mentioned the fulfilled prophecy and uh, as being uh, proof, and also uh, Randy did as well. Fulfilled prophecy has got to be another incredible proof for the inspiration of the Bible. Uh, yeah, exactly right. Uh, the, the, the Bible is full of just literally hundreds of prophecies, and we see them fulfilled uh, in, in amazing detail. Um, the, the, the most amazing collection of those prophecies has to do with the life of Jesus himself. There are over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament describing the life of the coming Messiah. Jesus fulfilled all of those prophecies in exact detail. It's, it's incredible. And I know that many of our listeners have probably uh, heard uh, a reference to a book called Science Speaks, written by a, a mathematician, actually, uh, named Peter Stoner. Mm -hmm. And so this Peter Stoner decided he would do a mathematical calculation on the probabilities that someone could, by chance, make the predictions about Jesus. But not 300 predictions like the Old Testament has. He took just eight prophecies about Jesus, and he concluded that no one, by chance, could make those predictions. He said the chance of making those predictions and, and someone fulfilling them just by chance, one in 10 to the 17th power was the, was the probability that that could happen by chance. And that was just the chance of fulfilling eight of the more than 300 prophecies about Jesus. So it would have been completely impossible for someone who was just trying to make all this up. Yeah. You couldn't guess. You couldn't guess it. And, and then just by chance, guess it accurately and correctly. It had to be inspired by yeah. God. Uh, right. Okay. Have we got a call to go to? Okay. All right. Uh, 
Bernard Ram. Again, I think our li- many of our listeners will know the name Bernard Ram because he's written a lot on evidences. And in a book called Protestant Christian Evidences, Bernard Ram said one real case of fulfilled prophecy would establish a supernatural act. But if our interpretation of the prophetic passages be correct, there are great numbers of them. Therefore, radical doubt must be certain that it has silenced the testimony of all the prophecies. Whereas the Christian asserts that rather than rest in the case of one prophecy, we have dozens, I would say even hundreds, at our beck and call. Oh, perfect. Excellent argument there. All right. Um, well, a couple more that our listeners didn't mention, but the, the writing style of the scriptures is another good proof of, of inspiration. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, as you were suggesting earlier, Jacob, the Bible does not... Uh, convey the superstitions and prejudices that existed in the time in which the Bible writers wrote. Uh, f- for instance, uh, it, it was commonly believed that in, in the ancient times that, uh, well, they had, they had lots of different views about, for instance, where did men, how did men originate? Yep. Now, in Egypt, in the time when Moses would have been a student in, in science class in Egypt, the prevailing thought was that men sprouted from little white worms that crawled out of the Nile River. Yeah. You know, that sounds silly to us. But that's what Moses got when he went to class. When Moses went to science class, that's what he was taught. Yeah. There were worms, man. Don't doubt it. There was those worms were yeah, crawling out of the yeah. river. Well, so Moses is going to write about creation. Yeah. Moses is going to write about where did man come from. He doesn't write about little white worms crawling out of the Nile River. Instead, he writes a, a, an account uh, in the book of Genesis that still stands the test of time today. A supernatural God created the world from nothing. He made man of the dust of the earth and breathed into him the breath of life. I mean... It's, it's still a, an incredible story. It's a, a story describing supernatural events, but it's not something like Little White Worms. Yeah, yeah. So it doesn't have the same type of superstitions and misunderstandings that were prevalent at the time that it was written. If someone was just making this up on their own, they'd have no choice but to include the modern-day superstitions and misunderstandings. Yeah. They, that's all they knew. That's all they knew. Exactly yeah. right. Another thing that is, I think, really telling is that there are no cover-ups in the Bible. Uh, Even some of the greatest Bible heroes are shown to be fallible men. King David is one of the great heroes of the Bible. His sins are plainly exposed. Abraham, great father of, uh, you know, of of the Israelite nation, but he, his weaknesses and his letdowns are, are displayed. If men were writing that on there, you don't expose the flaws of your heroes. If you're writing a book your hero is your hero, and he doesn't do anything wrong. And so that, that element of the biblical style suggests that's not the way men would write that. Right. They, right. they, they did not cover up okay. the flaws of their heroes. All right. All and right. then, and, and one more thing I would say, when you're talking about style, how's our time run? We got to get, we got, uh, in regards, the Bible is free from emotionalism. And a perfect example of that is how Jesus was tortured and crucified the bible writers record that history for us but it's free of emotionalism they just provide the facts they let us supply the emotional reaction to the facts but i don't think that's the way certainly that's not the way modern journalists would have written that story uh the the fact that it's free of the kind of emotional uh attachment is i think a sign that those men were inspired of god and the fact that the Bible is still around today. After, it has endured. After 3,500 years, perhaps, of some of the oldest writings. Yeah. It's still around, and it's Im- Im- impressively documented and preserved, the, the number of copies that we have. Oh, yeah, we're, we're going to talk that in about minute. that in a minute. But it's, it's also impressive that the Bible has endured when there have been throughout several centuries concerted efforts to, to eradicate it. Yes. And they never succeeded. But, of course, God said that he would not let his word pass. Yeah. And so the Bible, the, the preservation of the Bible is, is, a, 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 is an interesting argument, at least. may not, in some people's mind, prove inspiration, but it's hard to explain how that could happen if God wasn't behind it. You have a list of a, 
of prophecies that have been fulfilled, uh, yeah. and uh, and an extensive list of the prophecies about Christ. Uh, yeah, yeah. You can supply our listeners if they would like to yeah, send you an email. Exactly right. Send an email to questions at collegeview.com if you'd like that list of prophecies and those references. We need to get a break, and we get back. We'll go to the top of the hour. Now, the last question you asked. The last question we want to deal with is, how are you going to answer somebody who says, okay, well, even if I even if I allow that the Bible was inspired, that was a long time ago, and it's corrupted now. And we don't uh, the copies that we have today are there's no way that they are anything at all like the original. We don't even know what the original was, and so there's no way we uh, our Bibles cannot be trusted. They're not the same as what God gave. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to answer that on the other side of the break and get your thoughts. We're going to the top of the hour. Stay tuned. We'll be back right after this. After these important messages, we'll be back to take your comments. Email them during this break. Are you sure that the Bible said something, but you just don't know where? Is your salvation based on a passage that you know is in the Bible, but when asked, you couldn't find it? Do you do things in worship, but you couldn't turn to a book, chapter, and verse to show that God wants you to do it? If you answered yes to any of these questions, you may be suffering from BDD, Bible Deficit Disorder. God said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. The College View Church of Christ is dedicated to overcoming Bible Deficit Disorder in the metro area by teaching the Bible, the whole Bible, and nothing but the Bible. You are invited to attend our worship services on Sunday at 9.30 a.m. and 6 p.m. Join us in the fight against Bible Deficit Disorder. Attend one of our services for a healthy dose of the Bible. That's at the College View Church of Christ. Please don't give in to Bible Deficit Disorder. My name is Jim Meisner. I worship at the Church of Christ in Deckerville, Michigan. Be sure to listen to the virtual Bible study and watch it. Share your comment with the world. Call in now and be a part of the virtual Bible study. Now, back to the program. Back on the program tonight as we talk about inspiration and now a fundamental question. So the Bible was inspired back 2,000 years ago, but it doesn't do us any good if we don't have a copy of what was inspired. Yeah, and a lot of people think we don't. Yeah. Uh, and so how do we answer the critic who says you can't trust your Bible to be the inspired Word of God because it's just been, even if it ever was, and most of them deny that it ever was, even if it ever was, it's, it's now through the ages, through the centuries, it's been so perverted and corrupted in the handing down process that we can't trust it. Well... To answer that argument, Kent su suggested his uh, answer tonight. He said, it is the obligation of the critic of the Bible to produce the sources of corruption. This simply cannot be done. No source of corruption can be produced from the uh, Masoretic text of the Old Testament. No source of corruption can be produced from the accepted Greek text of the New Testament. Let the critic bring out the evidence, and we shall, upon proper examination, demonstrate their fallacy of thought, and we shall demonstrate that no corruption exists. So... Kent says you can't just make an argument like that without yeah. providing some proof. You can't just throw that out there. You can't just say, oh, yeah, well, the Bible, everybody knows the Bible's been all corrupted. No, no, not everybody knows that because it's not a fact. If you're going to state that as fact, you're going to have to give the evidence to prove that it's a fact. Where's your evidence? Yeah. I think Kent's Good exactly point, right. Kent. And Randy in Michigan, he says a text virtually identical with the prevalent Greek text of the Middle Ages, the Textus Receptus, was used by... Uh, Christentum, and other uh, Anti Antiochian fathers in the latter part of the 4th century, and thus must have been represented by the uh, man MSS manuscripts as old as uh, any now surviving. Uh, these Of these manuscripts, which uh, agree so closely with one another, Westcott and Hort state that uh, they must have ha had in the greater number of extant variations a common original either contemporary with or older than our oldest manuscripts, the manuscripts uh, of early versions and quotations from early Christian writers show uh, that the writings of the Textus Receptus were current in the manuscripts of the second and first centuries. Okay. Well, thank you, Randy. I think I get what Randy's saying there, and let's 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 flesh that out just a little bit. So it's obvious that we don't have any of what's referred to as the original autographs of the Bible writings, and by an autograph, what we mean is. The actual letter written by the hand of Matthew, for instance, or by the hand of Luke or John or Paul, Moses or Isaiah. We don't have any of the actual originals, what they call the autographs. So do we have accurate copies and how do we know that they are? Well, that is a field of study, a very deep field of study. And again, there are people who devote their whole lives to what is called 
textual criticism. And that is defined as reconstructing the long history of the transmission of the context from its, from its origins to our day so that the original context or text may be accurately restored. Now, how are you going to do that? How, how are we going to make sure we have the, 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 something that's identical to what was originally written? Well, this textual criticism, this study involves manuscripts. Manuscripts are copies written in the same language as the original. Um, so, you know, uh, the way I like to illustrate is uh, uh, one of the ladies has a really good recipe. And five women want a copy of the recipe. She, is, she doesn't have access to a copy machine, so she makes five handwritten copies. How, and, but then the original recipe gets destroyed. How do we know that those five that we've got are like the original recipe? Well, they all, because they all agree with each other. In fact, even if, even if one of them, where all the, all the other four said add butter, and, and, and one said add butterscotch, well, we say that that one that says butterscotch is is a, the outlier. A, that's an outlier. It, it, the, the other four prove that what that ingredient really was supposed to be is butter, and so you take the we don't have the original anymore. So you take the copies and you compare them, and when you when you see that all the copies are identical, you are convinced that you have an accurate version of the original, even though the original is not available anymore, and that's what the manuscripts do. Right. Um, and and. There's an overwhelming number of manuscripts of the Bible. There are over 5,000 manuscripts of the New Testament. And some of them date very early into the second century A.D. So the apostles and the other inspired writers of the New Testament wrote in the first century A.D. We got copies of what they wrote. We don't have the originals, but we got copies of what they wrote that are less than 100 years old, uh, newer than the original was. In other words, within 100 years, we got, we've got copies that were made within 100 years of the original. we got lots of copies. we got thousands of different copies. 5,000. And we can compare those copies, and we can say, that's got to be accurate because they all match. They all, they all harmonize. Now, uh, now that's, that's more. We have more documentation of the New Testament than of any other ancient document of anti antiquity. Yeah. The the other the the one that comes closest is are the writings of Homer, the Odyssey and the Iliad. But there's only a few hundred copies of those. But no one says we don't have a good copy of the of of Homer's works. No one says that. Everybody says, yeah, that's what Homer wrote. But when it comes to the Bible, they when we've got multiplied hundreds of times more copies, they want to somehow say we don't we we can't trust the outcome. The manuscripts, the manuscript evidence is overwhelming to prove that the Bibles we read today come from. Now, obviously, the Bibles we're reading from are in English. Nothing that uh, none of the Bible writers wrote in English, but we have translations made from manus compiled manuscripts of the originals. And so we can trust that the message in our Bibles is the same as the original because of the manuscript evidence. Yes. All right. Now we got other kinds of evidence. There's evidence which comes from versions, and versions are translations of the original. Okay. And the oldest translation of the Old Testament into another language is the Septuagint version. The, the Septuagint uh, version was a translation from Hebrew into Greek. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the, the word actually, the word Septuagint comes from a, a Latin word meaning 70. There were 70 translators mm -hmm. who translated the Old Testament from Hebrew into Greek. Um, this would have been the, the, the version that Jesus and the apostles used when they were referencing the Old Testament writings. So that's a, a really old version. We can use that version to help confirm that we have accurate transmission through the centuries. There are over a t 
10,000 documents of various versions of the New Testament. Um, the New Testament began to be translated into other languages as early as the second century AD. One of the first languages into which the New Testament was translated was Latin. And the best known translation of the original Greek New Testament into the Latin You've probably heard of the Vulgate. The Vulgate was a translation of the Greek into the Latin. We can study that, that version, again, to confirm. But, but get this, the Vulgate, and we have lots of evidence. I mean, we've got lots of mountains of, of documents uh, from the Vulgate. Well, the Vulgate was translated in 382. So where's all the time? Well, here's the question. Where's all the time wherein these corruptions supposedly happened because we can go back we can go back within a hundred years of when the originals were written and prove that we ha our bibles are taken from manuscripts and versions that date as far back as the second century a.d so all the corruption that supposedly have happened must have happened in that first few years because yeah. it didn't happen since we know it hasn't happened since because we've got these manuscripts, we've got these versions. All right. And then another thing that we use to sort of reconstruct, make sure that we have accurate conveyance of the text is a lot of secular writers quoted the Bible. We do the same today. That's what we do. So we're going to write an article and we're going to try to write on a, a Bible topic. We, we write, but then we quote some scriptures. Yeah. Writers have always done that. Writers dating back again to the second century A.D. quoted the scriptures. And so we can go to their writings and we can look and pick out the passages that they quoted. Oh, yeah. like oh, Well, back then, see, this guy was writing about baptism and he referenced Acts 2.38. And back then, he understood that it said, He that believeth and is baptized, oh, that, that's uh, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for remission of your sins. He's, he read that. He was writing that. Well, he copied it then and it's got the same words there. When he referenced it, that it has today, so and again, it's unchanged. And again, a lot of those writers wrote within a, a short time period after the end of the New Testament. Uh, Clement of Rome uh, wrote from A.D. 30 to 100. Justin Martyr wrote from 100 to 165. Irenaeus wrote from 125 to 192. There wasn't a lot of time for all this supposed corruption to creep in. And so our answer, our conclusion is definitively we have an accurate copy of God's inspired word. The Bible was inspired by God word for word, and we have an accurate copy today. That leaves us with one conclusion. We need to be studying that. It's a very valuable thing that we have in our hands. We need to be studying it, and we need to be submitting our lives to what it says. It's yeah. from God. It's what he wants from us. We need to be doing it. Exactly right. All right. Well, good discussion tonight. Thanks, Jacob. Uh, and Kyle, thank you for being here. That was good. Good discussion. Yeah, good discussion. And uh, thank you for our listeners for joining us. Hope you benefited from our study and discussion of God's Word. If you have questions or you'd like more information, questions at collegeview.com is the way you can contact us. We hope you make plans to be back here this time next week for another edition of the Virtual Bible Study. And in the meantime, we encourage you to put God first in your life, study His inspired Word of the Bible, and live by it every day. You'll never regret it. Thanks for listening to the Virtual Bible Study, brought to you by the College View Church of Christ. The College View Church of Christ meets at 1618 Hampshire Pike in Columbia, Tennessee. If you are in the Columbia, Tennessee area, we encourage you to worship with the College View Church of Christ on Sunday mornings at 930 and on Sunday evenings at 6 o'clock. The College View Church of Christ also welcomes you to attend their Wednesday night Bible studies at 7 o'clock. If you have any questions about something that was said on tonight's broadcast or would like more information about the College View Church of Christ, please call 931-381-4567. That number again, 931-381-4567. Or for more information on the internet, visit collegeview.com. Be sure to tune into the virtual Bible study this time next Thursday for another informative study of God's Word.